Good morning. Good morning. This is a blessed service that the Lord has bestowed upon us this morning. Amen. To, to have these little ones with us, to have the heartfelt testimonies, um, just to be in the house of the Lord and away from that world for a little while, like Brother Ron was talking about, uh, that old world out there pull you down, drag you in. Sin will take you further than you ever wanted to go. Like I said last time, sometimes that swim back to shore is a tough one. Let's, uh, let's have a moment of prayer here before we begin the Lord's message. Our Heavenly and Holy Father, again we come to you in truth and in spirit. And we thank you and we praise you, Lord, for everything that you do give us. You gave us your Son. You gave us one another. You gave us the opportunity to spend eternity in your kingdom. Lord, our, our hearts are with you. Our minds are renewed in Christ to serve you through him. We do love you so much. We thank you eternally. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, there was a certain man who was very wealthy, very successful. Now, this is an actual, true description of someone's life. We won't bring names up, but we'll just, you know, this is a truthful description. This man had more friends. He had, he literally had, a, I believe, a $50 million mansion, 10-car garage, cars in the garage that are $100,000, $200,000 a piece. Um, not, not arguably a trouble in the world. Until one day, he was not feeling well, and he went to see his doctor. And his doctor gave him some bad news. So we'll fast forward just a little bit. This man is now home, and he's in a position to where his flesh is about to fail him. The end of his carnal existence is at hand. He has dear close family and a few dear close friends around him. And as he lays there and he spends his last moments talking with his family, the moment is at hand. As he closed his eyes in death, death of the flesh, something became very apparent. The big house and all the friends out in the world and, and the big cars and all that Suddenly, they all very quickly lost all their meaning, and they weren't as shiny as they used to be. And this man's entire existence came down to one thing, and that is the choices that he had made. When we're standing at the moment where we leave this existence and we wait for the Lord to return, our choices are the hinges on the door, so to speak. I know a preacher, good preacher, good man, and he was talking not too long ago about when you walk through a cemetery and you see a tombstone and you see the year they were born and you see the year they passed from this world. There's a little dash in the middle. For being such a small digit, such a small character, that, that dash, it represents every single choice that you've ever made. Like Brother Ron said, we're going to give account for what we've done, but we're also going to give account for what we didn't do. To know to do good and not do it is a sin. Okay? So our choices here, um, if we have any people here that happen to like George Jones, 25 years ago he actually sang a song called Choices. And a lyric in that song is, I live and die with the choices I've made. And that is very true. Yeah, yeah. It is very, very true. So if we look over in the, in the 25th Psalm, <clears throat> it tells us, For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, 
For it is great. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. Okay. So weak people tend to chase pleasure. Strong people tend to chase purpose. The world offers us pleasure. The Lord offers us pleasure purpose. There's a very clear dividing line there. And we all know in Joshua 24, uh, Joshua says to all of Israel, choose you, I'm sorry, choose you this day whom you will serve. But when he said that to all the people of Israel, before they could even answer, he stepped in and said, but as for me and my house, we choose the Lord. Okay. Now, 1 Kings, in the 18th chapter, when the Lord told Elijah to go see Ahab, okay, and Ahab and Obadiah were out, and Elijah ran into Obadiah, who reluctantly went back and got Ahab um, and told him Elijah was there. When Ahab approached Elijah, um, there was a, a request made that Ahab would gather all the people of Israel, and Elijah went and told them this very thing right here. 1 Kings 18 and 21. And Elijah came unto all the people, all the, all the Israelites, and said, How long halt ye be twin two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. Does anyone remember what the people answered when Elijah told them, follow God or follow Baal, but make your mind up? Does anybody remember what the people said? And the people answered him, not a word. Not a word. Sometimes I think maybe the choices we make are just as bad as the indecision that we struggle with. When you, when you are renewed in the mind, as in Christ Jesus, you tend to get away from the indecisions of life. The things that you waffle on and both sides of the fence, you know, uh, double-minded, if you will, these are the things that quickly go away because you are spiritually led in a way that you instantly can discern what is right, what is wrong, what you need to be involved in, which way you need to walk when you come to a crossroads. See, the Lord gives us all free will. He gives us free will. But he will not trespass on your free will. Christ himself said in the Gospel of John, if you love me, there's your choice. You have a choice. That choice is based out of the free will that God gave us. God wants us to love him out of our desire to love him. Not because we're afraid of, you know, you know, the, 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 the punishment of, of disobedience to God. He wants us to love him out of us, our free will and choice. That's the only thing that really means anything to the Lord. If he forced us to love him, what kind of love is that? You know, it's like if you have two spouses and one's bullying the other, right? That's not a marriage. It's not a marriage. It's just not. Um, at least it's not a biblical marriage, let me say that. You have to love one another out of your free will to love. And that's a choice. It is a choice of free will. The Lord will offer us guidance, protection, healing. He'll offer us all these things, but he won't force us. If we look at the 23rd Psalm, when it says that thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me, do we all know what a shepherd uses his staff for? To guide the way that the sheep walk. And if a sheep wanders off, well, he just lifts it around, takes the hook. Come back here, right? Come back here. Don't walk that way. There's wolves over there. Don't walk that way. He'll love us, he'll guide us, he'll lead us, but he won't force us. Everything that determines our eternal life with Christ 
is based on decisions and choices that we make. Once we're given the gospel, it's up to us to decide what to do with it. Do we obey? Do we let the world get in our ears? I know this. I know when I'm standing in that day with the Son of God, with my Lord and Savior, that he would ever look at me and say, you knew better. Why did you not obey? Kind of like Paul wrote in the New Testament, what hindered you from obeying the truth? How do you look at him and say, well, Lord, everybody down there on earth said it wasn't that big of a deal. You knew better. You made a choice. You made a choice. You know, we have to make choices with what the Lord gives us. He gives us musical talent. He gives us wisdom. He gives us intelligence. He gives us just all kinds of gifts that we all have. I'm sure we all remember the parable of the talents, how the, the, the master gave one uh, servant five, one two, and one one uh, talent, and then he goes off and he comes back, and he judged those servants by what they did with what he gave them. They doubled it, or they just sat on it and gave him back what he gave them with no gain. And, uh, you know, the Bible says, you know, one one plants, one sows, one uh, waters, and God provides the gain. Uh, and there's been some, there's been some choices made throughout biblical scripture that, you know, it's had pretty heavy effects on mankind. Eve made a choice. She made a choice that affected all of us. But Esau also made a choice. Now Esau, I would never say he made a choice because he was lacking in wisdom, but when he sold his birthright, do we remember why he sold his birthright? Not because he was hungry, not because he wanted that, that red stew or that red, you know, porridge. Do we remember why he actually gave his birthright to his brother? Because he said, I am at the point to die. He literally thought he had no use for it. I'm fixing to check out, I'm fixing to die, I'm done. Feed me, make me feel better right now, and you can have whatever you want. And, and that's what happened. But Christ was also very hungry, much like Esau was. And he had a choice. Turn these stones into bread, he was told. No. No. He made a decision based on wisdom and scripture. And Esau and Christ were in the same spot. They were both very hungry. They were tempted by food. And food doesn't seem like a big tempter. But it actually is. There are people out here who literally live in the Bible and says, you know, if you eat and drink unrighteously, you know, you kind of live and die by it. You know what I mean? And it is that big of a deal. But Christ also made another decision. And people may not look at this, but when Christ was in Gethsemane, after Peter cut the ear off, he said... Could I not ask my father and receive more than 12 legions of angels? Okay. He went to the cross and he hung on that cross and he suffered in the most brutal way that you can suffer. Not, not just in the flesh, he suffered spiritually. Okay, The whole time he had the ability to ask for these 12 legions of angels, more than 12 legions of angels, but he didn't do it. He made a choice. So now, what are our choices? We choose to come to church, we choose to worship the Lord. We choose to carry the light out into the world and try to save one more. But now what happens 
when things aren't going so well? What happens when we feel bad, when we're sick, when we're hurt? How does that impact the way that we make choices? What influences our choices? I think some of our worst choices do get made when we're sick or, Lord forbid, we're under the influence of something. We've had a little alcohol or we've had whatever. Um, hopefully, you know, we abstain from that. Um, if not, the Lord will help you with that. But um, when you're sick, when you're hurt emotionally or physically, when you're under the influence of things, we tend to make very, very, very bad choices. And in First Peter, it tells us, be sober and be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Seeking whom he may devour. Now that tells me that there's people that he can't devour. That fair? Fair. Who are these people? Those who have chosen Christ. Your choice of obedience to Christ will protect you from being devoured by the enemy. And then we look at when it is time to make our decisions, our choices, how do we make the best possible decisions? Well, obviously we pray on things. We ask the Lord for wisdom. The Bible says, he who asks God for wisdom will be given it abundantly. And in Proverbs, which I really like Proverbs, I like the whole Bible, but the Proverbs second chapter, Proverbs was written by primarily Solomon. Solomon is known for his wisdom. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth come knowledge and understanding. And this kind of goes back to the renewing of the mind. Once your mind is truly renewed, once you have separated from the world, which is an enmity to God, and you're in the spirit, your choices become clean. They become holy. They become pure. They will protect you. Financially, they will protect you. Physically, they will protect you. But more importantly than all that, spiritually, they will protect you. It is absolutely, once again, the hinges on the door of our existence. Because we're all going to live forever. Even when the flesh fails us, we're all going to live forever. It all hinges upon your choices. And, um, I know that we got some food next door there. And I don't want to take too awful long, but... Um, you know, like Brother Ron was saying there earlier about, you know, how the devil tries to get at you and, and stuff like that. You know, I've often thought that uh, if, if I had my way, I would really enjoy the fact of being so strong in the spirit, having faith so, so strong that when I'm off the battlefield of the spiritual warfare, that the devil would celebrate, that he doesn't have to fool with me anymore. That is who I want to be as a representative and an heir in Christ Jesus. And that only comes with, once again, the renewing of your mind, but it comes with our choices. And people don't understand. There's no such thing as a little white lie. The Bible says all liars, not some or most, all liars will get their part in the lake of fire. White lies. This world is lying to us. A white lie to your spouse so you don't have to argue with them. You're making a bad choice. You're choosing to lie to avoid carnal conflict. The Bible says be at peace with all men if possible. That doesn't mean lie. The, the first sin mentioned in the Bible is a lie. That's what the serpent did to Eve in the garden. When Eve made her choice, 
to disregard and disobey what God told her. But now if you look at that, after all that happened, when God was coming back looking for him, who was he looking for? God, God didn't come down and say, hey, Eve, where are you? Uh-uh. He came down looking for Adam. Right? Eve made the decision, the choice. Adam was the one whose name got called. So we need to understand sometimes that the choices that we make might pin somebody else to the board. And that's what happened in the Garden of Eden. That's what happens. And it's all based around deception, about not being honest. Eve knew she made a bad choice. But Jesus Christ made it all better. Every bit of fallen sin that lays upon man is avoidable because one man made a choice to go right there and leave those 12 legions of angels up above and hang and hang for people that hated him that's a big choice because he, he hurt you hear people say, oh, you know, kidney stones, worst pain I've ever felt. Oh, broken leg, worst pain I've ever felt. Think about what he did. Amen. Think about what he went through. For people that pulled the hairs out of his beard, for people that blindfolded him and struck him and then mocked him by saying, oh, king of the Jews, who hit you? They whipped him, 40 stripes. He still made a choice to hang here when he had a way out. If we could ever get in our hearts that kind of love for each other, then we could say we have a Christ-like love. Because that's what a Christ-like love is. But this world, buddy, this world will tell you it's no big deal. Right? pastor down there, he said something just the other day, he said you bring people into a court of law, and you hold out a Bible, and say put your hand on this Bible and you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and they say absolutely they sit down in that chair and the lies start rolling, yeah. that's what the world brings, why? Because they don't want to be held accountable they don't want to get in trouble but they, they made a bad choice that now they have to lie to try to get away from. Once again, we have to go back to our choices. And those choices hinge on the renewing of our minds. We have to forget the world. We have to look above. We have to look up. And we're not perfect. You know, we have, everyone in here knows we're not perfect. can't be perfect. There's no way we could ever be perfect. Because if any of us walking in the flesh were perfect, that could put us in the same sentence as Christ, and that's not happening. There is no one in this world that's ever been born or ever will be born that can ever stand in the shadow of Christ in comparison. That's why we can't be perfect. But that's why he had to be perfect. Okay? But I know we got some food next door, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and get ready and wrap up here. And once again, we, uh, we just always, always have to be conscious and aware, even the little things. Little things make big things. Um, the choices that we make. I guess once again, as the song says, we live and die with them, you know. So.